Heavenly Father, we're grateful for you this evening. We thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity to be gathered once again. We thank you, O oh God, for your grace and your mercy, for your forgiveness. We thank you, O oh Lord, for keeping us through this day. We thank you for this roof that you've provided for us and the food that you've provided for us and the fact that we are in good health. We thank you, Lord, that we are not alone and that we can call upon you at any day and time. And Lord, you will hear our prayer. Father God, I thank you for the correction and the convictions thus far. I thank you for the revelations, O oh God, for opening our eyes through scripture and for allowing us to be even more bold to others and with our faith as well as with the things that we know that are wrong and using the scripture to help others to then see the truth. I thank you for showing us what love truly is. Love means long suffering and sacrifice. Love is not contractual and love is hard work. I pray, O oh Father God, that we will be able to love others the way that you have loved us, the way you have instructed us to love others as we love ourselves. I thank you, O oh Father God, for who you are, for who you continue to be. We honor this evening as we do every evening, the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that he is our savior, that he came on this earth only to die for our sins, so that we would be royal priesthoods, that we would be able to be heirs to the kingdom of God. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that was left behind for us. And I thank you, O oh Father God, that Jesus Christ is the mediator, seated on your right hand, interceding on our behalf. Tonight we pray for those who have yet to surrender their hearts, who don't believe that there is a point in serving you, but at the same time they are battling mentally with all the nonsense and distractions and the chaos of this world. We pray for those who are homeless and hungry, those who are in a hospital bed, those orphans tonight, those who are struggling and don't know what their next move is. We pray for those who are thinking about divorce or thinking about ending their lives. Father God, we place each and every one of them in your hand. And we pray, O oh God, that a messenger will be sent to them with this message. I pray, O oh Father God, if someone is roaming YouTube and that are looking for some form of encouragement, I pray, O oh God, that they will be able to access the right YouTube channel with the right encouragement that their spirit is yearning. And if someone happens to reach our page and hears the word, I pray that the word saturates their heart, that they would be unction to surrender themselves to you, Jesus, and allow you to come within their hearts and to work within them. Father God, all you're asking is for us to allow you to let you into our hearts so that you can work within us. And I pray for that for each and every person, oh God, who has yet to accept you, to know what true joy is and to, joy, to know what true peace is. For peace and joy can only come from you. We give you thanks and we give you praise. We honor you tonight for who you are. It is because of who you are, we are able to face tomorrow. It is because we don't serve a dead God, we serve a God who is 
seated in heaven. We serve a Jesus who was dead and risen and seated at the right hand of the Father. We acknowledge the Holy Spirit that goes forward and that is able to give us that gift of discernment. Open our eyes to see things that we weren't able to see before. We're grateful for the opportunities you've given us. And we thank you once again. Thank you for the healing power. Thank you for healing our minds and for transforming us, oh God. Thank you for allowing us to have a mouthpiece and the ability to learn and to hear your word. We honor you, we thank you, we praise your name, we lift your name on high, we exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Second Kings chapter eight. Years before, Elisha had told the woman whose son he had brought to life, leave here and go, you and your family, and live someplace else. God has ordered a famine in the land. It will last for seven years. The woman did what the holy man told her and left. She and her family lived as aliens in the country of Philistia for seven years. Then when the seven years were up, the woman and her family came back. She went directly to the king and asked for her home and farm. The king was talking to with Gehazi, servant to the holy man, saying, Tell me some stories of the great things Elisha did. It so happened that as he was telling the king the story of the dead person brought back to life, the woman whose son was brought back to life showed up asking for her home and farm. Gehazi said, My master, the king, this is the woman, and this is her son whom Elisha brought back to life. The king wanted to know all about it, and so she told him the story. The king assigned an officer to take care of her, saying, Make sure she gets everything back that's hers, plus all profits from the farm from the time she left until now. Elisha traveled to Damascus. Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was sick at the time. He was told the holy man is in town. The king ordered Hazael, take a gift with you and go meet the holy man. Ask God through him, am I going to recover from this sickness? Hazael went and met with Elisha. He brought with him every choice thing he could think of from Damascus, 40 camel loads of items. When he arrived, he stood before Elisha and said, your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, sent me here to ask you, am I going to recover from this sickness? Elisha answered, go and tell him, don't worry, you'll live. The fact is, though, God showed me that he's doomed to die. Elisha then stared hard at Hazael, reading his heart. Hazael felt exposed and dropped his eyes. Then the holy man wept. Hazael said, why does my master weep? Because, said Elisha, I know what you're going to do to the children of Israel. Burn down their forts, murder their youths, smash their babies, rip open their pregnant woman. Hazael said, Am I a mongrel dog that I do such a horrible thing? God showed me, said Elisha, and you'll be king of Aram. Hazael left Elisha and returned to his master, who asked, So what did Elisha tell you? He told me, Don't worry, you'll live. But the very next day, someone took a heavy quilt, soaked it in water, covered the king's face, and suffocated him. Now Hazael was king. In the fifth year of the reign of Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, became king. He was 32 years old when he began his rule, and he was king for eight years in Jerusalem. He copied the way of life of the kings of Israel, marrying into the Ahab family and continuing the Ahab line of sin. From God's point of view, an evil man living an evil life. But despite that, because of his servant David, God was not ready to destroy Judah. He had, after all, promised to keep a lamp burning through David's descendants. During Jehoram's reign, Edom revolted against Judah's rule and set up their own king. Jehoram responded by taking his army of chariots to Zer. Edom surrounded him, but in the middle of the night, he and his charioteers broke through the lines and hit Edom hard, but his infantry deserted him. Edom continued in revolt against Judah right up to the present. Even little Libna, 
revolted at the time. The rest of the life and times of Jehoram, the record of his rule, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah. Jehoram died and was buried in the family grave in the city of David. His son Ahaziah succeeded him as king. In the twelfth year of the reign of Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began his reign. Ahaziah was twenty-two years old when he became king. He ruled only a year in Jerusalem. His mother was Athaliah, granddaughter of Omri, king of Israel. He lived and ruled just like the Ahab family had done, continuing the same evil in God's sight line of sin. Related by both marriage and sin to the Ahab clan. He joined Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, in a war against Hazael, king of Aram, at Ramoth Gilead. The archers wounded Joram. Joram pulled back to Jezreel to convalesc from the injuries he had received in the fight with Hazael. Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of Judah, paid a visit to Joram, son of Ahab, on his sickbed in Jezreel. 2 Kings chapter 9 One day Elisha the prophet ordered a member of the guild of prophets. Get yourself ready, take a flask of oil, and go to Ramoth Gilead. Look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi. When you find him, get him away from his companions and take him to a back room. Take your flask of oil and pour it over his head and say, God's word, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and get out of there as fast as you can. Don't wait around. The young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. On arrival, he found the army officers all sitting around. He said, I have a matter of business with you, officer. Jehu said, which one of us? With you, officer. He got up and went inside the building. The young prophet poured the oil on his head and said, God's word, the God of Israel, I've anointed you to be king over the people of God over Israel. Your assignment is to attack the regime of Ahab, your master. I am avenging the massacre of my servants, the prophets. Yes, the Jezebel massacre of all the prophets of God. The entire line of Ahab is doomed. I'm wiping out the entire bunch of that sad lot. I'll see to it that the family of Ahab experiences the same fate as the family of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and the family of Basha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, the dogs will eat her carcass in the open fields of Jezreel. No burial for her. Then he opened the door and made a run for it. Jehu went back out to the master's offices. officers. They asked, is everything all right? What did that crazy fool want with you? He said, you know that kind of man. I'll talk. That's a lie, they said. Tell us what's going on. He said, he told me this and this and this. In effect, God's word, I anoint you, king of Israel. They sprang into action. Each man grabbed his robe. They piled them at the top of the steps for a makeshift throne. Then they blew the trumpet and declared, Jehu is king. That ignited the conspiracy of Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, against Joram. Meanwhile, Joram and the entire army were defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Aram, except that Joram had pulled back to Jezreel to convalesce from the injuries he got from the Arameans in the battle with Hazael, king of Aram. Jehu said, if you really want me as king, don't let anyone sneak out of the city and blab the news in Jezreel. Then Jehu mounted a chariot and rode to Jezreel, where Joram was in bed resting. King Ahaziah of Judah had come down to visit Joram. A sentry standing duty on the watchtower in Jezreel saw the company of Jehu arrive. He said, I see a band of men. Joram said, get a horseman and send him out to meet them and inquire, is anything wrong? The horseman rode out to meet Jehu and said, The king wants to know if there's anything wrong. Jehu said, What's it to you whether things are right or wrong? Fall in behind me. The sentry said the messenger reached them, but he's not returning. The king then sent a second horseman. Then he reached them, he said. The king wants to know if there's anything wrong. Jehu said, What's it to you whether things are right or wrong? Fall in behind me. The sentry said, the messenger reached them, but he's not returning. The 
The driving is like the driving of Jehu, son of Nimshi. Crazy. Joram ordered, get my chariot ready. They hitched up his chariot. Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, each in his own chariot, drove out to meet Jehu. They met in the fields of Naboth of Jezreel. When Joram saw Jehu, he called out, Good day, Jehu! Jehu answered, What's good about it? How can there be anything good about it as long as the promiscuous whoring and, sor and sorceries, sorceries of your mother Jezebel pollute the country? Joram wheeled his chariot around and fled, yelling to Ahaziah, It's a trap, Ahaziah! Jehu pulled on his bow and released an arrow. It hit Joram between the shoulder blades and went through his heart. He slumped to his knees in his chariot. Jehu ordered Bidkar, his lieutenant, quick, throw him into the field of Naboth of Jezreel. Remember when you and I were driving our chariots behind Ahab, his father? That's when God pronounced his doom upon him. As surely as I saw the blood of murdered Naboth and his sons yesterday, you'll pay for it on this exact piece of ground. God's word. So take him and throw him out in the field. God's instructions carried out to the letter. Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw what was going on and made his escape on the road be toward Beth Hagen. Jehu chased him, yelling out, Get him too! Jehu's troops shot and wounded him in his chariot on the hill up to Ger, near Iblium. He was able to make it as far as Megiddo. There he died. His aides drove on to Jerusalem. They buried him in the family plot in the city of David. In the eleventh year of the reign of Jorab, son of Ahab, Ahaziah had become king of Judah. When Jezebel heard that Jehu had arrived in Jezreel, she made herself up, put on eyeshadow, and arranged her hair, and posed seductively at the window. When Jehu came through the city gate, she called down, So how are things, Zimri, you dashing king killer? Jehu looked up at the window and called, Is there anybody up there on my side? Two or three palace eunuchs looked out. He ordered, Throw her down! They threw her out the window. Her blood spl spattered the wall, and the horses and Jehu trampled her under his horse's hooves. Then Jehu went inside and ate his lunch. During lunch, he gave orders. Take care of that damned woman. Give her a decent burial. She is, after all, a king's daughter. They went out to bury her, but there was nothing left of her but skull, feet, and hands. They came back and told Jehu, he said, It's God's word, the word spoken by Elijah, the Tishbite. In the field of Jezreel, dogs will eat Jezebel. The body of Jezebel will be like dog droppings on the ground in Jezreel. Old friends and lovers will say, I wonder, is this Jezebel? Second Kings chapter 10. Ahab had 70 sons still living in Samaria. Jehu wrote letters addressed to the officers of Jezreel, the city elders, and those in charge of Ahab's sons, and posted them to Samaria. The letters read, This letter is fair warning. You're in charge of your master's children, chariots, horses, fortifications, and weapons. Pick the best and most capable of your master's sons and put him on the throne. Prepare to fight for your master's position. They were absolutely terrified at the letter. They said, Two kings have already been wiped out by him. What hope do we have? So they sent the warden of the palace, the mayor of the city, the elders and the guardians to Jehu with this message. We are your servants. Whatever you say, we'll do. We're not making anyone king here. You're in charge. Do what you think is best. Then Jehu wrote a second letter. If you're on my side and are willing to follow my orders, here's what to do. Here's what you do. Decapitate the sons of your masters and bring the heads to me by this time tomorrow in Jezreel. The king's sons numbered 70. The leaders of the city had taken responsibility for them. When they got the letter, they took the king's sons and killed all 70. Then they put the heads in baskets and sent them to Jehu in Jezreel. A messenger reported to Jehu, they've delivered the heads of the king's sons. He said, stack them in two piles at the city gate until the morning. 
In the morning, Jehu came out, stood before the people, and addressed them formally. Do you realize that this very day you are participants in God's righteous workings? True, I am the one who conspired against my master and assassinated him. But who do you suppose is responsible for this pile of skulls? Know this for certain, not a single syllable that God spoke in judgment on the family of Ahab is cancelled. You're seeing it with your own eyes, God doing what, through Elijah, he said he'd do. Then Jehu proceeded to kill everyone who had anything to do with Ahab's family in Jezreel. Leaders, friends, priests, he wiped out the entire lot. That done, he brushed himself off and set out for Samaria. Along the way at Beth Eked, which means binding house, of the shepherds, he met up with some relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah. Yeah. Jehu said, who are you? They said, we're relatives of Ahaziah, and we've come down to re a reunion of the royal family. Grab them, ordered Jehu. They were taken and then massacred at the well of Beth Eked. 42 of them, no survivors. He went on from there and came up upon Jehanadab, the Rechabite, who was on his way to meet him. Greeting him, he said, are we together and of one mind in this? Jehanadab said, we are, count on me. Then give me your hand, said Jehu. They shook hands on it, and Jehanadab stepped up into the chariot with Jehu. Come along with me, said Jehu, and witness my zeal for God. Together they proceeded in the chariot. When they arrived in Samaria, Jehu massacred everyone left in Samaria who was in any way connected with Ahab, a mass execution just as God had told Elijah. Next, Jehu got all the people together and addressed them. Ahab served Baal small time. Jehu will serve him big time. Get all the prophets of Baal here, everyone who served him, all his priests. Get everyone here, don't leave anyone out. I have a great sacrifice to offer Baal. If you don't show up, you won't live to tell about it. Jehu was lying, of course. He planned to destroy all the worshippers of Baal. Jehu ordered to make preparation for a whole convocation for Baal. They did and posted the date. Jehu then summoned everyone in Israel. They came in droves, every worshipper of Baal in the country. Nobody stayed home. They came and packed the temple of Baal to capacity. Jehu directed the keeper of the war wardrobe, get war robes for all the servants of Baal. He brought out their robes. Jehu and Jehonadab, the Rechabite, now entered the temple of Baal and said, double check and make sure that there are no worshippers of God in here. Only Baal worshippers are allowed. Then they launched the worship, making the sacrifices and burnt offerings. Meanwhile, Jehu and sta had stationed 80 men outside with orders. Don't let a single person escape. If you do, it's your life or his life. When Jehu had finished with the sacrificial solemnities, he signaled to the officers and guards, enter and kill, no survivors, and the bloody slaughter began. The officers and guards threw the corpses outside and cleared the way to enter the inner shrine of Baal. They hauled out the sacred phallic stone from the temple of Baal and pulverized it. They smashed the Baal altars and tore down the Baal temple. It's been a public toilet ever since. And that's the story of Jehu's wasting of Baal in Israel. But for all that, Jehu didn't turn back from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, the sins that had dragged Israel into a life of sin. The golden calves in Bethel and Dan stayed. God commanded Jehu, you did well to do what I saw was best. You did what I ordered against the family of Ahab. As reward, your sons will occupy the throne of Israel for four generations. Even then, though, Jehu wasn't careful, in, um, wasn't careful to walk in God's ways and honor the God of Israel from an undivided heart. He didn't turn back from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who led Israel into a life of sin. It was about this time that God began to shrink Israel. Hazael hacked away at the borders of Israel from the Jordan to the east, all the territory of Gilead, Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh from Aror near the brook Arnon. In effect, all Gilead and Bashan, the rest of the life and times of Jehu, his accomplishments and fame are written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Jehu died and was buried in the family plot in Samaria. His son, Jehoahaz, 
was the next king. Jehu ruled Israel from Samaria for 28 years. Amen. Amen. Amen.